exhausted, so I just let my people hear. Um, as many of you know, Eitan Nandrawal was a central person in the Population uh, Studies Center and in the Graduate Group for Demography for about 20 years, 1972 to 2001. Eitan brought to the center a very international kind of focus. He had worked for years in uh, Africa. He was from Belgium. He had worked in France and then uh, worked uh, at uh, Princeton on the project on the demographic transition in, in Europe. And then uh, we were fortunate to have Aton as a colleague here for uh, several decades. In Aton's memory and honor, uh, the prize was established to give every other year to the half the modesty related paper written by graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania uh, for the prize. And it's been a depressing list of recipients in front of me and in the chair. This year's committee uh, was composed of myself, Gordon Bowen, and Carol Clifford, and John McDonald. And I think we all thought we had a very nice school of occupation. But we also there's a strong consensus that Benji's Benji is a doctoral student in economics, but as you can tell from her talking, she has worked on many demographic related questions uh, pertaining to family, childhood, labor market, public policy, uh, etc. And you'll get to see Thank you for a great introduction, Jerry, and thank you all for coming today. So I'm very happy to present my job market paper here at Penn PhD. So uh, let me directly dive into my paper. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you don't. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now I think. Now it's on, right? Okay. Great. Uh, so please interrupt at any time if you have any clarifying questions or any 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 questions or comments. So let me start from motivating facts. Although gender gaps in labor market have been narrowing down over the past 30 or 40 years, still there are significant gender gaps remaining in the labor market, especially between married men and married women. In fact, literature has documented that there is substantial gender gap in labor supply after childbirth. So women significantly reduce their labor supply after their first childbirth but men do not. Also, other papers have documented that there, there seems to be a wage premium for married men, whereas women, when they return to the labor force after giving a childbirth, they receive much lower wages, and, contrib and this contributes to a big gender pay gap in the labor market. And economists have called this as child wage penalty. So in this paper, I'm going to study like what are the determinants of this child wage penalty and how we can tackle this problem through some policy instruments. And in this paper, I'm going to focus on one important aspect, which is job flexibility. So job flexibility has become increasingly important in recent years. So if you look at this LinkedIn survey, there seems to be more employees now want flexibility. Also, another survey from Harvard Business Review says, uh, job flexibility in terms of more flexible hours, more vacation time, and work from home options are at the top of the list of benefits which are most valued by job seekers. More importantly, job flexibility is very important for parents with young kids. So 31% of women who took a break after having kids 
they actually wanted to keep their working position, but said that their job was too inflexible to keep their working status. And indeed, this job flexibility generates some heterogeneous responses in terms of labor supply after childbirth. So here I plot the changes in working hours from one year before the first childbirth to the one year after the, first, after the childbirth. Um, on x-axis, I put the joint flexibility group of husband and wife. So for, I, I will be more clear about what kind of job flexibility that I'm talking about in this paper and how I'm going to measure this job flexibility in later slides. But for now, please bear with me that there is a measure of job flexibility. And based on this measure, I'm going to uh, group occupations into two groups, high flexibility occupations and the low flexibility occupations. So here the first letter is for the husband job flexibility, and the second letter is for the wife's flexibility. So HH meaning both husband and wife working in high flexibility occupations, and HL husband high and wife low. And on y-axis, I put the changes in working hours, again, one year before and one year after the first childbirth. So I want to point out a few things here. First, let's uh, focus on wife's job flexibility. So I'm going to compare the first and second bar here, fixing husband's job at high flexibility. And let's look at uh, how, the, how having the low flexible job affects women's labor supply after childbirth. So it seems like women, when they work in low flexibility occupations, they reduce their working hour more after the childbirth. And same thing is, happens for this group as well. That's the first thing. And second, I want to point out now, uh, let's focus on husband job flexibility. So I'm going to compare the first and third here. Then fixing wife's own flexibility at high, having husband working in low flexibility, it seems like wife reduced their labor supply more. And from this simple mean difference graph, the difference between the first and th third seems to be bigger than the difference between first and second maybe implying that husband job flexibility has greater impact on wife's labor adjustment after childbirth. And the last thing that, yes? Is, is, is this whole guy a conditional on uh, Conditional on any working work, work status before the childbirth, yes. So potentially, yeah. So, so some of these are people who are dropping out of the workforce totally. Yes, so those are, I'm trading just like zero working out, <coughs> exactly. Okay, uh, so. Last thing that I want to point out from this figure is husband working in low flexibility occupation, these two bars here, they actually increase their <coughs> labor supply slightly after childbirth. And this seems to be quite like counterintuitive because they are working in low flexibility occupations, but they're the one adjusting more after the childbirth. So I'm going to uh, discuss this po point when, when I get to the event study analysis. But this is like basically coming through the income effect. So I'll be more clear about this point. Okay, so based on all of these interesting facts, here are my research questions. First, uh, how does the job flexibility affect labor supply and wages of married men and married women after childbirth? Here, I'm going to use a measure of flexibility developed, co constructed by Golding 2014. And in this paper, I'm going to show you that this uh, measure of flexibility actually captures different dimensions of flexibility, including flexibility in working hours, flexibility in work shift, and flexibility in work location. And then using this flexibility measure, I'm going to look at how own flexibility affects labor adjustment after childbirth, and also how the spouse's occupational flexibility affects this adjustment. Especially, I'm going to focus on how husband job flexibility affects wife's labor adjustment. Then I'm going to ask, what are the effects of policies affecting job flexibility temporarily after childbirth? So like if, if we can increase job flexibility through some policy instruments, does, it going to, uh, does that going to reduce the gender pay gap? And or how about the child wage penalties? So that's what I'm going to do in this paper. So to answer these questions, these are what I do. So this is going to be kind of like a roadmap of today's talk as well. Okay. First, I'm going to show you the empirical relationship between occupational flexibility 
and married couples labor adjustment after childbirth. So here I'm going to use uh, event study specification developed by Clavin et al. 2018, but with a little tweak that introduce uh, this flexibility margin. And then uh, I'm going to develop and estimate a new dynamic household model with labor supply and occupational choice. So the main objective of having this model is to capture the mechanism that generates a strong interdependence between spouses and also how, how, I can, how I can capture this flexibility channel. So I'll be uh, more specific about this when I get to the model part. And lastly, using this estimated model, I'm going to evaluate policies that affect workplace flexibility temporarily after childbirth. So before jumping into any details of my paper, I will just briefly mention the related literature. So uh, in recent years, there has been many papers documenting the existence and uh, the significance of the child wage penalty observed in the labor market, including the Clavin and Angelus paper. And also following these uh, papers, there are a lot more papers try to investigate what are the determinants of these child wage penalties. And my paper is closely related to these two strands of literature. First one is about the occupation and workplace sorting. And the second one is about time flexibility and working hour. So the first group of paper studies how the self-selection of women who prefer some kind of like family-friendly amenities, how does that decision affect the gender pay gap in the labor market? So the occupations which provide higher family-friendly amenities, they actually give you lower wages. And when women prefer to work in those type of occupations, that actually contributes larger gender pay gap. So that's about the first uh, group of papers. And the second group that, especially this Goldin 2014 paper, uh, this one says, when occupations compensate longer hours of work more, and men can actually increase their working hour based on these incentives, but women cannot because of this child care duties and also other like housework duties, then this actually generates larger gender pay gap. So we, we tend to observe larger gender pay gap in those observations which compensates longer hours of work. My paper try to bring the husband dimension into the analysis. So I'm going to look at how husband occupation are sorting and also how husband occupation uh, wage scheme, like for example, if husband occupation compensates longer hours of work, how does that, does that feed back into the wife's labor supply and also gender pay gap? And also I, I want to mention the policy implication here. So recent papers like this Bailey and others paper actually documented that uh, the paid parental leave policy introduced in early 2000 in California when we look at the long-term outcome of these policies, that actually doesn't generate any positive impact in terms of like increasing female uh, labor participation rate. Because these policies essentially make women to take the leave by giving them incentive to take this paid parental leave. So in the long run, we, it may help them to like care children better, but in terms of uh, reducing the gender pay gap and increasing labor supply, it doesn't, it seems it's not helping much. But in this paper, I'm going to focus on other types of family-friendly policies, which is providing temporal flexibility. And this actually gives incentive to remain at the job even after the childbirth. And that can, I, I'm gonna show you, that can actually generate some long-term positive effects. Okay, so uh, how I'm gonna measure the job flexibility in this paper, I'm gonna use the ONET database. So as I mentioned previously, I'm going to use a measure developed by Golding 2014. And here uh, she is using, she's, she selects some these uh, five characteristics related to work activities and work context from the ONET database. So these are like how much time pressure do you feel at work? How much of your daily tasks are structured? And how often have you, do you have full contact with others? And how much freedom do you have? And how important is this 
interpersonal relationship is. So these are uh, how these how each of these characteristics is related to the concept of flexibility. This is uh, the explanation is given in Goldin 2014. So unless you have any specific questions, I'm gonna uh, skip this part. So uh, exactly the flexibility measure is going to be the average of these uh, five normalized only characteristics. So these had these original scales like five Likert type of uh, uh, variables. And I'm going to use this average of these uh, characteristics. But in this paper, I go one step further here and I do a validation exercise with, th with this measure. So I merge this flexibility measure with the American time use survey data and I check how individuals working in more flexible occupations use their time and location differently when there is a young kid at home. So basically what I find here is when people working in high flexibility occupations and, and when they have a young kid at home, they work little less hours per week and they're more likely to work outside of this typical nine to six work shift and they're more likely to work from home if they can do any work from home. So there are some occupations that cannot be done uh, at home at all. So ex excluding those occupations, the proportion of hours worked at home is increasing with this flexibility measure. So I believe uh, based on this exercise, I believe the flexibility measure that I'm using in this paper is quite intuitive and also consistent with the notion of flexibility used in other papers, yes. This is actual hours per week. So less hours per week. Yes. Um, seems small, but we have to also interpret this part here. So the flexibility score is normalized to have mean zero and standard deviation of one. Oh. So one standard deviation, yeah. yeah. Okay. And the last, day, the main data set that I'm using in this paper is the household panel analysis Y79. And I select married couples with certain age. And right now I'm excluding all the self-employed households because self-employment itself is very different from like say traditional employer employment relationship in terms of their tax policies and also other like non-pecuniary benefits. So right now I'm excluding this part. And from now on, occupations uh, will be categorized into two groups based on the flexibility measure that I just introduced. So above median will be high flexibility occupation and below median will be no, yes. Do these people have more than one job? Uh, some people do have more than one job. I am taking just main job, meaning that they're spending most of their time. I'm just taking the flexibility of the main job. But the I'm treating all the hours, hours are all working hours, yes. Okay, so um, before moving on to the model part, I'm going to show you some empirical facts that motivates my modeling uh, features. So first, a set of empirical facts are based on this event study specification, uh, similar to Claven at all 2018, but here I'm going to include this flexibility margin. So uh, substrate P will be the year since the first childbirth and the outcome variable of household I of spouse J working in flexibility group O at event time T will be denoted as this Y. And here the flexibility group will be based on the occupations a year before the birth. So basically the idea is conditional on the pre-birth flexibility level. How does your uh, labor adjustment after childbirth change? So exact specification will be uh, regress this outcome variable onto the event time dummies with some controls. And here I'm in including age fixed effect, calendar year fixed effect, and both husband and wife's education level and their interactions, and also pre-birth average wage levels. So the basic idea is try to make these two groups of household as similar as possible in terms of their pre-birth observable characteristics and try to look at this pre-birth flexibility margin only. Okay, uh, so here 
I am uh, looking at four different outcomes. First one is wife's working hours, conditional on working. So let me show you the graph here. So on the x-axis, I put the event time, year since the first childbirth, so zero meaning the year of the birth, mi minus one is one year before, four, four years after. And here, this is percentage change of working hours, conditional on working status. And with different colors, I am uh, plotting different flexibility groups. So the darker colored line is for the low flexibility occupation, and the lighter colored line is for the high flexibility. So as you can see, wives with high flexibility, although their initial adjustment is larger, they can quickly come back to the level of their pre-birth labor supply. Whereas women working in low flexibility occupation, they stay this lowered uh, working hour level persistently. Yes? Can you do any adjustments or analysis on subsequent births? Um. Yeah, so this is based on the first birth. When I condition on the second and third birth, to begin with, I am selecting people who have working condition a year before birth because I want to condition on the pre-birth flexibility. To, be, like, to begin with, there are not many women actually working because you see like these women quit after the first childbirth. But in terms of magnitude, it's much smaller because of the selection, but they remain in the labor force even after the second birth. Okay, so that's the first outcome. And the second outcome is wife's labor participation based on husband flexibility. So again, if you look at this graph here, when husband working in low flexibility occupation, this darker colored line here, wives actually quit their, uh, quit their job more often that compared to the case where their husband actually working in one of the high flexibility occupation. And the third outcome variable is what about the husband's side? So husband working in low flexibility occupation, combining here, I'm combining ex intensive and extensive margin together, they actually increase their labor supply slightly. And this is consistent with the uh, very first graph that I showed you. So if you combine this graph with the previous graph, when husband works in low flexibility occupation, their wife are more likely to quit her working, uh, quit her job. And perhaps now they have much lower household income and husband try to compensate this foregone household income by increasing their own labor supply. So this is one income effect that I observed from the data. And I, I'm going, I, I will try to capture this uh, strong income effect, which generates the interdependence between spouses' labor supply in my model. Okay, and the last outcome variable is the wife's hourly wages. So you've seen so far how, these, how does the labor supply decision affect, uh, supply decisions are affected by flexibility margin. But here, now uh, if you look at how the hourly wages change depending on this flexibility. When husband working in low flexibility occupation, wife actually face much, much lower hourly wages in the long run. And this is even more shocking if you think about this graph is actually subject to selection effect. So all the wives who decide not to work, they may face much larger uh, wage penalty. because who choose to work will be the one who is getting higher wages because they face much. Okay. And the last empiric fact that I want to show you before going into the model part is a, a strong trade-off between flexibility and earning. So here I, put, uh, here I fit the annual earning and hourly wages on annual hours of work. Again, with different colors, I'm plotting different flexibility groups. First thing you can see from these two figures is this darker colored lines are above the lighter colored line, meaning that workers in less flexible occupation, they earn more money. There is a clear trade-off. 
between flexibility and earnings. And the second one that I want to highlight here is more about the flexibility itself. So this can be uh, shown in convexity in earnings graph and the slope in hourly wages graph. So content, these are low flexibility occupations, they disproportionately compensate longer hours of work more. And this is like clearly related to the flexibility margin directly because if you are working in one of the low flexibility occupation and you have new childbirth, then you might think, oh, I want to reduce my working hours. But because your job compensates longer hours of work so much more, now you face much larger opportunity cost. And this may make, uh, in terms of like adjusting your working hours, this may make your job too inflexible. Okay, so based on all of these uh, important and interesting effects, uh, I'm going to model how the household choose how much to work and which occupations to work around, the, uh, around their first childbirth. So first I'm gonna give you the overview of my model. This is going to be a dynamic discrete choice model of household with occupational choice and labor supply. I assume household has a unitary preference meaning that both husband and wife, they don't have their own utility, but they try to maximize the joint household utility without any like strategic uh, like uh, negotiation or game played in the household. And uh, occupations in each period, both husband and wife will choose how much to work and which occupation to work from this uh, discrete set of working hours and occupations. And occupations are characterized by different wage offered and also flexibilities. And in the model, I'm going to assume changing occupation is costly. Uh, right now, I assume fertility is, is exogenous and stochastic process, and households value hours at home differently when there is a young child at home. So let me get into the details. As I explained, they're going to choose how much to work and which occupations to work from this discrete set of working hours and occupations. So the first option for in terms of working hours, this is not working option. And the last one is full-time working. And in between, I'm, allow, I'm allowing like two levels of part-time options, part-time low and part-time high. And in my model, I, I'm going to assume all the remaining time after, after uh, supplying your labor into the market will be used for home production. And occupations, there are two groups of occupations, low flexibility occupations and high flexibility occupations. And you're going to choose uh, next period occupation in every period. Wage offer part is uh, like kind of standard. So there will be a occupation specific full-time wages. So your log wage, the log full-time wage Will be uh, will depend on occupation specific base baseline wage and wage premiums for college graduate and returns to the human capital. So these are all occupation specific. So high flexibility occupations may not value, say, for example, college gra graduates compared to the low flexibility occupations, and also the returns to human capital can can be uh, different across these two. Occupations. More importantly, flexibility is going to be captured two, through two different channels. Uh, each of them is to capture different dimensions of flexibility. So I'm gonna explain the second part first. So uh, this is to capture how easily can you change your working hours. And this is, the, this is, uh, this is going to be captured through this part-time wage penalty. So previously, I showed you this full-time wage and depending on your working hour, your full-time wage will get penalized. And this GJO function is occupation specific. So if you're working in one of the low flexibility occupations, you may face much larger part-time wage penalty. And this gives you this inflexibility in terms of changing your working hour after the childbirth. And the second channel is about, uh, second channel is to capture these different dimensions of flexibility, including flexibility in work shift and flexibility in work location. 
And I'm going to capture these uh, channels through this non-pecuniary benefit because in the data, I don't see how these married couple use their time and location in any granular level. So what I did is to lump all the other dimensions of flexibility into this non-pecuniary benefit. And I let this benefit value vary based on whether you have a young kids at home or not. So potentially your job may allow you to like freely shift your working hours or ch like choose to work from home. But when you have young kids at home, you may want to utilize these dimensions more. So I'm gonna allow these uh, benefit value depending on this age of the youngest child. Other parts of the model are more straightforward. So as I explained, fertility will be stochastic and exogenous depending on wife's age and education level of both spouses. So with this probability PT, uh, you, you will get new fertility shock and your age of the youngest child will be reset to zero. And with probability one minus PT, nothing happens. If you have a child, then your kids get older. And when there is a young child present in the household, the value of uh, hours at home will be, will be different. So this gamma J parameter is in front of the log leisure or log hours at home. So when there is a young kids at home, then you, are, you value your hours at home more by this gamma J bar parameter. Um, lastly, human capital is assumed to be general and accumulates based on working hours. So your human capital level for the next period, x t plus one, will be your current period human capital plus this new human capital accumulation. And this will depend on how many hours you work. So HM was the uh, full-time working hours. If you choose to work in the full-time position, then you will accumulate one more unit of human capital. But if you choose to wanna work one of the part-time positions, depending on this Rho J parameter, you may accumulate much lower human capital level. For example, if this one is really large, the graph will look like, like this. So unless you work in full-time position, you're going, you're going to accumulate almost uh, zero human capital. Yes. Yeah, so I may, uh, in terms of like modeling this, I may choose to have this like occupation specific human capital, but that's very computationally costly. So what I did is instead, I allowed the, them to pay different prices for this human capital. Okay, so putting everything together, this is like value function. I'm just gonna explain the key mechanism uh, how my model can capture the strong interdependence between spouses and flexibility at play. So if you get this new fertility shock, you value your hours at home more. So this gamma J parameter will change. Now you want to spend more time at home and you wanna reduce your working hour. But your part-time wage penalty function will decide your hourly wages. So if you face much larger part-time wage penalty, it's super costly. So spouse with relatively lower part-time wage penalty will adjust their labor more. That's the first channel. And if you were working in one of the high flexibility occupations, then you get this non-pecuniary benefit. And when you have new child at home, then this benefit value may get amplified. So you will have additional incentive to remain at the job and providing positive working hours even after the childbirth. Okay, so I will skip this part and I will just explain the key parameters of the model. So I have like 39 parameters right now. I'm using method of simulated moments. Uh, I'm just, plot, uh, I'm just uh, showing you some of the key parameters here. Uh, first one that I want to highlight here is this gamma parameters. So this is, uh, these are the coefficients in front of the log hours at home. And when there is no kids at no young kids at home, it seems like husband and wife value their hours at home similarly. These are like, in fact, these are not statistically different. But once you have a young kids at home, now the changes in gamma value, wife's hours at home are much more valued than the husband hours at home. And this may reflect, for example, the natural competency in terms of childbearing or uh, because I'm not modeling this social norm or 
some kind of like stigma effect in the labor market, all of these will be loaded onto this par these parameters. So if women, like society, they put more pressure for women to re like um, to stay at home after the childbirth, these parameters will uh, be estimated really high. It seems like this is the case here. And also, if labor market puts some stigma effect on husband taking leave, then that will uh, put some pressure to make these, uh, this parameter smaller. So these will be all kind of like loaded onto these two parameters, and I'll be more than happy to discuss about this, but this is like how I uh, model these, uh, all of these channels like in a simplistic way. And the second set of parameters are related to this flexibility. First, uh, first one is related to this wage, part-time wage penalties. First, these are all positive, meaning that when you choose to work from one of the part-time positions, then you will get lower hourly wages. That's the first thing. And if you compare these numbers with this, these numbers, then when you work in low flexibility occupations, you face much larger part-time wage penalties, making you uh, to uh, inflexible, give, this gives you inflexibility. And the last one that I want to highlight here is when comparing this husband and wife, in, especially when they work in part-time low position, husband face much larger part-time wage penalties. And the second uh, parameter related to flexibility is this non-pecuniary benefit. Again, these are all positive, meaning that when you work in high flexibility occupation, you, you do get this uh, non-pecuniary benefit. And when there is no child, husband actually get higher non-pecuniary benefit. Because I'm normalizing this non-pecuniary benefit of low flexibility occupation as zero, you may interpret this as the difference between the low and high occupations in terms of their non-pecuniary benefit. And it seems like husband actually face this larger difference across these occupations. Okay, now uh, with the remaining five minutes, I'm gonna uh, explain the counterfactual policies and I'm going to get some questions. So the idea is what would happen if we make these occupations more flexible temporarily after childbirth? So uh, in my model, I had these two channels to capture the flexibility. So in this exercise, I'm going to change each dimension separately. First one is to remove the part-time wage penalty temporarily after childbirth, making the full-time and part-time receive the same hourly wages. So this I call equal pay policy. And the second uh, policy is to equalize non-pecuniary benefit of flexibility across these two occupations temporarily after childbirth. So even if you work in one of the low flexibility occupations, I'm going to, I'm going to give the same non-pecuniary benefit. And I call this as equal benefit policy. And the exact policy design that I'm simulating here is each benefit will be applied for two years after any new childbirth. So even if you get second and third uh, fertility shot, you will get these benefits. And also I'm going to uh, look at how the effects of these policies change depending on whether we wanna give these policies to wives only versus both spouses. So first let's focus on what would happen if we give these policies to wives only. First, uh, when these benefits given to wives, they increase wife's labor supply in the short run because we are giving this additional benefits. One, just making the part-time wage penalty equal to zero, so in the baseline, even, even if you were thinking of dropping out of the labor force, now you may think, oh, maybe it's uh, better to remain in, at the job working in one of the part-time positions. So that's one thing. And two, now even if you are working in this low flexibility occupation, you can enjoy this non-pecuniary benefit. And this will give you uh, additional incentive to remain at the job. And this generates this short run uh, positive impact on female labor force participation. But more interestingly, there are some uh, occupational sorting going on as well. Because these policies essentially make the low flexibility occupation more attractive compared to the high flexibility occupation, a lot more women now start working from one of these low flexibility occupations. So in the baseline, 
women actually expect to have a kid in the future, and they know they're going to enjoy this flexibility margin later in their life cycle. So they self-select into one of the high flexibility but low paying occupations in the baseline. But under these counterfactual scenarios, now, even if you're working in one of the low flexibility occupation, you can enjoy all these benefits. So even before the birth, a lot more women now start working in this low flexible but high paying occupation. And these two, uh, benef uh, these two impacts generate the long run impact. So the uh, short run increase in labor participation due to this direct work benefit. And second, this resorting into high paying but low flexibility occupation will increase women's uh, hourly wage in the long run by up to 8%. And this translates into the drop in the gender pay gap also almost by 8%. But what is gonna happen if we give these policies to both husband and wife? Now, I am making this uh, low flexibility occupation more attractive even for the husbands. And they're the one who actually faces much larger kind of like a flexibility constraints because they face much larger part-time wage penalties and also they have this larger gap in terms of non-pecuniary benefit across these two occupations. So now the resorting into this low flexibility and high paying occupations with much uh, more sub substantial, substantially larger for the husbands. And yeah, substantially larger for the husband. And given the low flexibility occupation, the gender pay gap between men and women in, um, in this low flexibility occupations are higher. So now as a household, Husband can earn enough money for the entire household, and that actually gives lower incentive to wife work at all, mitigating the positive impact coming through the wife's, uh, wife's uh, flexibility changes. So now, previously you, you saw this uh, positive impact on hourly wage for wife was 8%, but now it's, it reduced down to 5%. At the same time, now husband uh, earn a lot more money. So in terms of gender pay gap, we may see even uh, expanding gender pay gap in the long run. But this is like, uh, I should interpret this uh, with some caveat because I'm fixing all the wage equations. So conditional on the current wage determination process, this is what you're going to see. But perhaps if I endogenize this wage determination process, giving both benefits to husband and wife may actually reduce the gender pay gap in the low flexibility occupation a lot more, then the story may get different. So that's one of the future uh, research projects that I'm planning to do. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. Do uh, you have any questions? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of like a like black box. So I'm taking these uh, job characteristics from the ONET database, and based on that, I am uh, just ranking occupations. And these different characteristics actually capture different dimensions of flexibility that you just mentioned. So that, that's like hard questions to answer, but I, I think I skipped the part that I try to give you some example based on this. Yes, flexibility measure. So based on this flexibility measure, these are like occupations that has low flexibility and high flexibility. So financial managers, physicians, these are low flexibility occupations based on this measure. And like bi biological scientists, computer programmers are categorized into this high flexibility occupation. And I checked like where is the economist and sociologist in this distribution. Uh, so as I mentioned, this has like a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. We are about like minus 0.2 and minus 0.3, so somewhere in the middle. But sociologists seem to have a little lower flexibility than economists. <laughs> yes.
yeah, so um, I did like bunch of robustness check. One thing that I did is try to incorporate other characteristics that Golden didn't use. So these are these seem to be very closely related to this flexibility. And even if I include these uh, additional characteristics, it seems like the all the results are remain qualitatively. Yeah. Like and so are the results, you know, is one dimension of flexibility really driving the results? Are other dimensions as well? Yeah, so, uh, well, given my framework, I can only answer whether the flexibility in terms of working hours more matter versus flexibility in terms of other dimensions of flexibility. And based on this framework, it seems like, uh, let me go back to my, Counterfactual. So if you compare these two columns, so this one is in terms of uh, flexibility in working hours, and this is for the other dimensions. They're about the same, but slightly larger for this equal pay. But I think this one has more uh, difference between these policies. So when we give these policies to both husband and wife, the equal benefit policy, the difference between husband and wife was a lot larger in terms of this non-pecuniary benefit dimension. So when I give this uh, benefit to husband working in low flexibility occupation, a lot of them, they sort into this low flexibility and high paying occupation, and that actually uh, generates a lot larger impact. So for husbands, in terms of which dimension matter more, it seems like these other dimensions, in, not, not about this working hour. Yes. Um, do you know anything about the character of study in terms of the kids we have about the other uh, equal benefit? Like, what, what is the kind of sorting for the different kinds of reasons uh, and trends that they have that support the different dimensions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. I haven't looked at that. I only looked at my home country, South Korea. It seems like the flexibility margin matter more there, but because we have worst paid parental leave policies and everything, but maybe that's why. But these uh, European countries has a lot better uh, family-friendly policies. So to begin with, we, we may not see this big gender difference in terms of labor market outcomes. Yeah, so I haven't looked at, but that's a great suggestion. Thank you, thanks. Yes. Uh, this one or? I'm, I'm going backward or forward? Ah, uh, this one. I see. Yeah, so these uh, four parameters are for husband, and these four are for wife. So there's a wage penalty for both husband and wife? Everybody? Yes. And how, how do you explain the wage penalty for husband? So when they choose to work one of the part-time positions, then you, as I explained during my talk, husband face much larger part-time wage penalty. And in the labor market, we have this gender pay gap to begin with in the full-time wage penalty. So it seems like some type of screening going on in the labor market. So firms, ex for men, they expect, even after the childbirth, you, uh, firms are expecting men to work in one of the, these full-time positions. And when they, um, when they not to do that, they actually penalize husband a lot more. 
But it seems like... I'm, I'm surprised because I, I, you know, I always saw their focus on, on the whites as their solution. So I think it's a very interesting finding. I don't know if it's a, a, a simple difficulty. I, uh, that's why I was asking that you know, I think you know, we are both talking about solutions because it's not a bad idea. It's not an it's not expected. But this is a, but that's only part of Yeah, if they decrease hours, if they choose to work in part time, it's. it's there are some cases in the data where they do decrease their hours, so almost can't have them. Yes, exactly. Right. So, full time here is. Uh, I am using. So I'm using the average working hour for each group here. So the average working, imagine this is like having their first childbirth around like late 80s and early 90s. So people are working crazy amount of hours. <laughs> so this is how I uh, categorize full time versus part time. Yeah. So why less hours when you have more time? Yes. Have you tried to check any of these parameter estimates against like an event study approach? Because you see sometimes you can switch afterwards. Are the results you get from this, um, you know, full model consistent with like a reduced form uh, event study? So yeah, that's a great point. So I, I didn't exactly like compare my numbers with the event study specification, but I do check this some of the model fit things. So I, I think I have it here, but I basically. I can capture this uh, cross-sectional distribution well, and also the joint distribution between husband and wife well, and also the, the changes uh, all around the first childbirth in terms of labor supply and occupational switching. Yes. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the that's the main part of the policy simulation. So I allow them to switch their occupation, mm -hmm. and based on this additional incentive, they actually switch towards the low flexibility jobs. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so you're thinking more about like a gig economy type of like yeah. very flexible and very unstable jobs. So I think uh, in my paper and also in Golden's paper, we are looking at some different dimensions of flexibility. So these flexibility, um, in some sense, these are like a perk of the job, not necessarily some bad thing. Like you can easily get fired. That's not like that. So that's quite different. But I guess, uh, so ONET data may, using the ONET data, I may be able to construct a different version of flexibility. Yeah, so, and, and then I can probably compare how different flexibility are co like correlated to each other, for example. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a great 
Yeah, that's a great point because like we tend to see a lot high, larger gender pay gap for those occupations. Like, yeah. So well, I guess these benefits would certainly help in theory, but like in terms of how we can actually implement these uh, ben benefits for those type of occupations, especially like in terms of productivity, clearly longer hours of work generates larger productivity, then how can we actually measure that compensation that government need to like provide to those companies? That's like a hard question to answer. <laughs> yeah. So like I think for, for that part, I think I have to have more like occupation specific framework to actually estimate those costs. So the division in this colloquium is to be very inflexible. <laughs> it always uh, uh, flows at what it costs. So let's thank Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.